A quick warning. Due to the graphic nature of today's topic, listener discretion is advised. Today's topic includes discussions of violence, murder, and death. The views and opinions discussed on today's show may not be the views held by the hosts, but those of the historical figures mentioned. As you listen, we ask that you keep in mind that one must tread with care when looking back in time and not judge the actions and opinions of others by the standards of today. Yeah, I'm home from the office. Becca, dear, are you in the house? I'm in the kitchen, dear. Your evening pepper is on the table by the chair, along with your pipe. <laughs> she knows me all too well. Dear, it says here that your uncle's friend, you know, the, um, the, um, um, the one with the limp from the wall. Mr. Healy? Yes, sweetheart, quite right, quite right. That's the one. Anyway, it says here that his mattress factory caught on fire. No, dear. I hadn't heard. That's awful for him. Burn most of the stock, it says. Terrible shame, terrible shame. Eight thousand dollars in damages, too. Glad he's not insured by our company. I say, there's more on that Elizabeth Halliday case in here. You know the one. The Catskills Ripper, they're calling her. I wonder why it wasn't front page news. She's a horrible, horrible person, Bernard. I say, you are not wrong, Becca. Look here. It says they're going to commute her sentence to life in confinement in an insane asylum, instead of putting her to the death she deserves. Bernard, say it isn't so. She's supposed to have killed at least five people. Why would they try to treat her in an asylum? It was that damnable Democrat Governor Flower that changed the sentence. Says here, Commission found that she was too insane to be put to death. Who makes up these rules? I must say they should just take a tall tree and, well, um, anyway. Bernard, with all these killers out there, now will you please add another lock to our door? New York is beginning to be a lot less safe than it once was. Of course, Becca, my peach. I will have it done straight away. Is that dinner ready? Trippers, welcome to another episode of the Road Tripping Podcast. As always, it's great to have you tuning in. If this is your first episode, then welcome. If it's not your first episode, then welcome back. As always, we want to take this opportunity to say thank you for letting us provide you with content that helps your commute suck just a little less. It really means a lot to us that you are listening. Today's show suggestion came to us from listener Ralph R. from Port Colburn, Ontario. He writes, Dean and Molly, thanks for your show. I just found it on Deezer and have added it to my podcast listening lineup. I'm a long haul trucker here in Canada, so I have a lot of time to listen to lots of different shows. One topic I heard a little about some time back was about the Catskills Ripper, Elizabeth Halliday. I haven't had time to look her up myself, but based on what I've heard, I think she would make a good research project for you two to present on a future podcast. Thanks for taking my suggestion. If you're ever in Canada, listen to your CB from my handle, Triple T, and give me a shout. Ralph. Trippers, if any of you listening want to submit a show suggestion like Ralph, head on over to our website, theroadtrippingpodcast.com, and click on the suggestions link at the top of the page. Ralph, thanks for the suggestion. Dean isn't as much of a true crime buff as I am, so I know he didn't know about this case, but it is one that's fascinated me too. Like you, I hadn't really looked into all the facts until now, but I found it definitely worth sharing what I found with our listeners. There's a lot of details to unpack, so hold on tight, trippers, as we take the exit ramp off the three-way and merge into the fast lane straight into today's show. Elizabeth Margaret McNally was the youngest of nine siblings born to John and Pam McNally from County Atrum, Ireland, sometime around 1859. Times were hard and work scarce for the McNallys while in Ireland because the country was still recovering from the Great Famine or as it's known in the West, the Irish Potato Famine. The McNallys, like their neighbors, decided that they needed to immigrate if they were to have any type of life for themselves or their children. So, in 1867, the eldest brother, Sam, and soon followed by his father, John, set sail for Philadelphia in the United States. In 1872, John McNally was finally able to send for his wife, 
and the remainder of their children to join him in their new home in Newburgh, New York. By then, Lizzie was eight years old and from all accounts was a happy, healthy, and normal little girl. She went to school, did her chores, and played just like any other kid. She even had a crush, well, probably a bit more than a crush, on an older boy who she was very fond of and was a close neighbor. Again, perfectly normal for a girl her age. In 1879, the family moved further up the Hudson Valley to Greenwich, New York, following the availability of work. And this is when the trouble started for Lizzie, who was now around 15. Lizzie, who at this time went by a nickname based on her middle name of Maggie, started to show problems dealing with social situations, often resulting in violent behavior. Coincidentally, it was also at this time she was expected to leave school and become a responsible and productive citizen, which she had a great deal of difficulty doing. Her family is reported as saying that she would often make poor choices, which would get her in a lot of trouble with her employers. One instance of this is when she became a domestic servant. Think traditional maid, which was the type of work that a lot of Irish women had to settle for at the time, to one of the more prosperous households in her town. While she began her employment with zeal and was by all accounts a good worker, it didn't stay that way. After being critiqued on baking that wasn't up to her mistress's liking, she flew into a rage, cursing out her mistress and threatening to have her arrested. Lizzie then went to the Justice of the Peace, alleging that she had been beaten by her employer. She was summarily dismissed, of course, but still came back to the property and acted like everything was fine. The family packed her bags and ejected her from their property. Another time, Lizzie was dismissed after having threatened a child with a butcher knife, telling her that she would kill her if she ever told her mother. Her employer stated later that she found Lizzie to be deceitful and untrustworthy, and no one should ever leave a child alone with her. If it were not for these accounts and the legal records of the day, we wouldn't know much about her early life at all. That is, until all of the marriage records are taken into account. That's right, records, as in plural. All told, by her arrest and incarceration in 1893, Lizzie had married a total of six times, but none of them lasted long and only resulted in one child, a son by her first husband named Charlie, after his father. Lizzie's first husband was a man named Charles Hopkins, though it turns out he was a deserter from the British Army and a con man going by the alias Ketzbull Brown. When she first met him, Charles was romantically involved with a married woman by the name of Mrs. Campbell, whom he was using to steal money from her employer, a local farmer, so they could use it to run away together. Once she had given him $200, he wrote her a letter telling her that he had scammed her and that they were over. But despite that, she was persistent in trying to be with him anyway. This was a situation that Lizzie found more than unacceptable and was very jealous. It wasn't long before Mrs. Campbell was found dead in her bed with the bottle of poison on the nightstand. Lizzie stated that she heard the woman tell Charles that she was sick and that he had given her a bottle, telling her that it was medicine. Since we only have Lizzie's statement on that fact, and since no forensic evidence collection existed like they do today to prove a connection, it remains unclear if Lizzie was involved in her death or not. Soon after the fatality of Mrs. Campbell, Lizzie married Charles, and the couple moved to Vermont so that Charles could go to work for her brush factory. Within a year, Lizzie had her son Charlie, and within another year, Charles Sr. was dead. Lizzie claimed it was from typhoid fever and that she didn't have anything to do with his death. A doctor at the time stated that he died of natural causes due to the lung irritation from inhaling bits of bristles from the factory where he worked that prevented him from breathing. But locals living near her never believed that to be the case. Charles had supposedly confessed to his personal doctor that he feared she would kill him. It was also at this point in her life that Lizzie's mental stability seemed to shift further towards insanity, particularly after the birth of her son. She seemed to suffer from depression, anxiety, and moodiness, which could be normal for such a young new mother, but she also complained of delusions and hallucinations. She once had told her sister about the singing she heard in her ears and of the lights going all around the house, but no one else could see the lights. 
But even with all of that, she was still shrewd enough to realize that once Charles was gone, she got what was left of the money he had conned from Mrs. Campbell. It is suspected with husband number two, money was definitely her motivation for marriage. In 1881, she married Artemis Brewer, a Civil War veteran with a military pension, who was not in particularly good physical condition at all. He suffered from rheumatism, dropsy of the heart, which today we call edema, and is swelling caused by fluid retention in the body. Was really short with an oversized head, large feet, and required the use of two canes just to be mobile. To top it off, Brewer also had an opium addiction from the medication he was given for his war wounds. Lizzie was known to exploit that fact by hiding his pills and then getting joy from watching his cravings kick in. She would then force him to do some sort of physical task that would earn him his medication as a reward. She didn't treat him any better in public either, often beating him or pulling his hair or beard while screaming at him. The public took note of her tantrums and steered clear of the family, including her son, who she didn't spare the beatings on either. The marriage to Brewer only lasted a year, as one night he unexpectedly died. His attending physician stated that the previous day he had been in passable health, despite his conditions, and was surprised by the death. Brewer's brother and a friend that had been with him at the time of his death said he was blue in the face and foaming at the mouth when he died. His death publicly was ruled as natural based on complications from his ailments, but privately, the doctor confided that he felt he had died from opium poisoning. While just like the case with Mrs. Campbell, there is no forensic evidence to support it, but there is a widely held belief that this was Lizzie's second murder. After Art Brewer died, Lizzie met Hiram Parkinson. He presented himself to Lizzie as a widower with several grown-up daughters, and it didn't take long before they were married. What Lizzie didn't know at the time was, and those that did, decided not to get involved due to her violent nature, was that Parkinson was still married to his estranged wife, Ada Gunn. Around Christmas that year, Parkinson told Lizzie that he was going to spend Christmas with his grown children, but Lizzie objected. She told him it would cost him too much money and began to physically fight him, literally pulling off his clothes as he tried to dress. Once he managed to succeed in getting her off of him and dressed, he found that she had stolen his keys from his pockets. Hearing the worst, he opened his trunk to retrieve the money he stashed there for the trip, a sum of $180, and found that it had been stolen. He immediately got an attorney and the police who confronted Lizzie over the theft. She claimed she'd taken the money to pay another attorney, though we couldn't find out for what the reason was, but it was gone. Parkinson told her that he was done with her and was going to his children for the holidays, and she should be gone when he returned. Which she was, but not before she cleaned out his entire house and sold everything for money. This marriage lasted approximately five months, but it wasn't the last of Hiram Parkinson's involvement with Lizzie that we'll see. Let me take you back for a second to husband number two. Remember his friend that attended him the night he died? You guessed it, he became husband number four in 1886. Lizzie had remembered George Smith was a friend of Brewer's and an old soldier with, surprise, surprise, a pension. She had approached him at his place of employment, a horse farm known as the Flat Iron House, where he received free lodging as part of his compensation for being a caretaker, and proposed that she be his housekeeper in exchange for a room for her and her now 12-year-old son. Within no time, Lizzie had laid on the charm to try to get old George to marry her. He, however, really didn't trust her because he was sure she was still married to Parkinson. She swore she never married Parkinson, and so he made her go before an attorney and swear and sign a legal document saying she wasn't married before he would entertain a proposal of marriage to Lizzie. This arrangement literally only lasted weeks because of Lizzie's violent tendencies. One day, during a quarrel with him, Lizzie picked up a flat iron and hurled it at him. Smith dodged it and escaped the house. Another time, Lizzie rushed at him with an open pair of shears and swore that she would kill him. She even went so far as to assault Smith's previous wife over a feather bed that she had in her possession that Smith was particularly fond of. She was arrested and taken before the court, where she didn't bother to pay attention to the lawyers or the judges, instead acting as if she had no idea why she was there and why anyone was upset with her. In the end, she was sentenced to 15 days in jail. Smith, of course, was made to pay her fines. 
The judge stated that it was obvious that she was faking her innocent behavior. Smith quickly found out that she really had married and was still married to Parkinson, but that didn't seem to stop his concern for his wife. She began to sneak out at night to meet with Parkinson, who seemed to have forgiven her, often not coming back home for a while. Smith even had the police out looking for her on several occasions, who confirmed that she was with Parkinson. It is not clear who thought up the next bit of the tale, Lizzie or Parkinson or both. But one morning when he sat down for breakfast, Lizzie tried to get him to drink some tea that she had made for him. It was prepared with milk and sugar, which Smith detested, and he told her as much. She teased him about it until he took a big drink, and only then did he realize his mistake. The tea was in fact poisoned in some way, and Smith began to be in severe pain. He shouted for help, and a neighbor was able to call a doctor who, after giving him a medication that made him throw up the tea, saved Smith's life. Now, you would have thought Smith would have sent her packing at this point, but within two days, he had forgiven her due to her extreme change in demeanor and sorrowful attitude. She professed to become a dutiful wife. Of course, that didn't last either, and one night when Smith came home, he found all the doors locked and no one home. He climbed through a window, only to find Lizzie had taken everything he owned, and later finding out she was seen leaving town with Parkinson. Lizzie's second go-around with Parkinson only lasted another week once she left Smith, so bye-bye with another husband. In case we haven't made it abundantly clear by now, Lizzie was a very manipulative person, often coming up with various schemes to get what she wanted. Just after she left Parkinson for the second time, she went to see her brother in hopes of getting a place to stay. At this point, the entire family had disowned her, and she knew she wouldn't be welcomed. So before she got to his home, she got some young men to carry her to his door on a litter under the pretense she had hurt her leg and was unable to walk. Her brother didn't believe her, but since her mother was living there too, he didn't turn her away. Her actions and attitude quickly wore on the family, and she was forced physically out the door three days later and told not to come back, ever. Her manipulative nature is probably what landed her husband number five, a house painter by the name of Charles Playstall. But truly, little is known about him, and within two weeks, Lizzie had left him and moved on. The weird thing is, though, no one who interviewed could even recall this guy being in the area. In 1886, Lizzie began traveling across country on foot and without a home for her or her son. She took the opportunity to travel to see her father, only to learn he had not only developed a severe mental illness, but had passed away. It is reported that she literally tried to dig up his body with her bare hands and had to be physically restrained. Maybe it was the stress of her father's passing, the fear that the police might have been after her for murder that no other family would tolerate her, or a combination of all of the above. But for whatever reason after that incident, she went to Philadelphia in the hopes of finding either relatives or family acquaintances, presumably to mooch from, for as long as she could. She did find an old neighbor from Ireland that took her in, but the man's wife put a stop to it quickly. In January of 1888, she ended up taking residence in a small home on Kensington Avenue where she paid the owner two months' rent up front, furnished the apartment with furniture on credit, then insured the furniture for 16 times its value. Since she then set to work developing a small market and lunch business out of the home, you might think that this was a shrewd business move, but since we've already described Lizzie's cunningness earlier, you can probably already see where this is going. Hello, Trippers. Do you have a podcast that you want to cross-promote? Or are you a business with a product that you would like to advertise? Then reach out to us at theroadtrippingpodcast.com to see how we can help. Your success is our success. So let us succeed together by getting the word out about your product or show to other listeners and potential consumers. Now back to the show. On March 11th through the 14th of that year, a huge storm blew in, dumping as much as 55 inches of snow on the ground and grounded the city to a standstill. On the morning of the 14th, 
A two-alarm fire was reported at Lizzie's location. It was completely out of control and spreading. The home and the two next to it were burned to the ground. When fire investigators examined Lizzie's home, they found no furniture, but did find kettles in the middle of the room filled with oily rags. I'm sure you already guessed it, but she tried to burn the place for the insurance money. Later, it was found that she had put the insurance policy in the name of Mrs. Smart, which of course is laughable for the absurdity of the choice, but also because she had no way to prove that it was her name. Nor would she be able to claim on it since none of the furniture was even in the house. She was eventually caught hiding out in the hospital across the river in New Jersey, where she had tricked the staff into believing she had real injuries that needed to be treated. The staff eventually labeled her as feeble-minded or having less than average intelligence and thus should be sent to an asylum. This stalled her questioning, but she was eventually taken into custody and her son was taken from her to never be with her again. During the questioning by the police, she told them of a wild story of unknown intruders entering her house and starting the fire. She, of course, heroically escaped the fire in only a petticoat and her son in her arms, but was too traumatized to remember more details to help the detectives. Unfortunately for her, she was found out during her booking when they found the insurance policy tucked between her breast. She was sent back to Philadelphia, and on March 18th, a preliminary hearing resulted in the finding that she should stand trial. That trial took place in April, and by May, she was sent to serve two years in the Eastern State Penitentiary for arson and insurance fraud. I want to jump in here with a little break in the tale to say a bit about Eastern State Penitentiary. About a year ago, Molly and I happened to be traveling in that area for a conference and decided to do all the touristy things people do when they go to Philadelphia. We went to see the Liberty Bell, Ben Franklin's gravesite, the first post office, etc. But we kept being told we should go check out the prison. So, sorry to all you Rocky fans, we skipped the tour of the infamous steps and with the remaining time we had, headed to the prison to check it out. Today this place is designated as a historic landmark and if you didn't know better, you would think it came right out of the Middle Ages due to the design, and not from the early 1800s. The prison had a unique setup. Every person was, at least originally, held in one of its 980 individual cells in strict solitary confinement. If an inmate were to leave their cell for any reason, they were hooded to prevent knowledge of the prison complex and to prevent any interaction with other inmates. They were also fed in their cells and only allowed supervised time outdoors in the exercise yard on rare occasions. Time in the exercise yard was scheduled so that no two prisoners were ever in the exercise yard at the same time. The idea behind the prison's solitary confinement areas were to use sensory deprivation to reform inmates. The thought was that the isolation and quiet would free the innately good soul of the inmate. We literally had no idea this would play into today's show until we were doing the research. I probably even read about her while I was there, and it just didn't click. Anyway, we took loads of pics, including of the cell that is said to have, much later in history, housed Al Capone when he was locked up there. Head over to the RoadTrippingPodcast.com website and click Headlights on the homepage to get to our blog and have a look. Now, getting back to Lizzie. It was said that she was an ideal prisoner while she was there, but she grew more and more insane as time went on. She was finally labeled as such by the prison doctors and transferred to the Philadelphia Almshouse and Hospital for Care. If you listen to our show on the Buffalo State Asylum, you will recognize the fact that almshouses were not the bastions of care you would expect from something labeled as a hospital. More of a halfway house and an internment facility for the poor, truth be told. Once Lizzie's time was up, she was released on parole, but quickly ditched the parole officer stealing some of her belongings and fleeing to New York. In the early 1890s, Lizzie was starting to get involved with the traveling gypsies and mountain people seen up and down the Hudson Valley. It is believed that she also stepped up her criminal game at this point and began to associate with Levi Roberts, a career criminal known for arson, burglary, horse theft, highway robbery, amongst other crimes. After she was arrested in 1893, she admitted that while in the company of Roberts, she suggested that she witnessed a murder of a traveling peddler by the name of Samuel Hotz. 
and alluded to the fact that it was committed by Roberts. Evidence later uncovered included a package that Robert had sent to Troy, New York for Lizzie to pick up that included two pistols, jewelry, and fabric samples that were the type the peddler would have sold. When Roberts was arrested sometime later for horse theft, the police found his wagon that was stained with blood, leading them to believe that they had killed the peddler and transported the body to the lead mine, where he was eventually found. Again, and I know you're tired of me saying this, but forensic evidence wasn't around at this time, so the evidence the police had was circumstantial. While they fully believed it was Lizzie or Roberts that pulled the trigger, they couldn't pin it on either of them, so the case went unsolved. In 1891, over the period of three short months, Lizzie met and married her sixth husband, Paul Halliday, 42 years her senior, who was, as you guessed it, a veteran and a pensioner. When they met, Halliday was looking for domestic help for his 100-acre farm, which he states was fairly prosperous. Lizzie was highly likely considering how to best collect his pension and take over his farm from the moment she got to know him. What she did not know, however, was that Halliday had a grown son living with him, who was considered an imbecile or feeble-minded, likely falling into what today would be on the autistic spectrum. That the farm's main income was making and delivering charcoal. That Halliday liked to drink up his money. That he suffered from rheumatism, so did little of the work himself. And that he could not keep domestic help because of the workload. And worst of all for Lizzie, he was often very broke. It was very quickly after the honeymoon that Lizzie figured out her mistake and had fully shown Halliday her temper, which he seemed to always overlook, even when she nearly choked his grown son to death one time, leaving him with permanent damage to his vocal cords. She also quite often threatened to kill them both. Eventually, one day while Holiday was away, the mentally challenged son Johnny was killed in one of the series of fires that Lizzie intentionally set. He died from suffocation while trying to save household goods from being destroyed. Holiday's account was that his son Johnny had overturned a lantern and started the fire and died due to the smoke. Lizzie told her husband that she had actually attacked the boy, slit his throat with a bread knife, rolled him up in a rug, locked the door, then started the fire because she hated him and Halliday for lying about the farm. Lizzie and Halliday, for some reason, remained together and traveled to the nearby town of Newburgh to buy a new horse team for the farm, since the old one died in another fire set by Lizzie. While her husband slept, Lizzie stole all of the money they brought and all his valuables and set out to leave town. She unfortunately decided to try her hand at horse theft and was caught and put in jail. Paul caught up to her at the police station and asked for her to be released. When the police brought her out for him to identify, she started her act of being insane and talking to herself to try to get out of the situation. Halliday informed them that this was all an act, but they insisted she go on trial for the theft. When he asked for the money that she had when arrested since it was his, they said it was impounded and he could not have it. That set Halliday off, and there on the spot, he accused her of arson of his home and the death of his son, to which Lizzie's later said was Halliday trying to get an alibi for the murder and arson scam he agreed should happen to help their struggling farm. Also, just prior to the fires on the farm, a neighbor's son, George Klein, went missing and was never found. George was 14 years old, and after Lizzie's wild behavior in Newburgh, Neighbors suspected she was very likely responsible for his disappearance, but it could never be proven. While the police in Newburgh had her in custody, Lizzie's sister showed up at the police station and gave the police a very unforgiving and unfavorable character reference. I'm pretty sure in hopes that they would throw her in prison forever. Lizzie was brought before Judge Beattie of the Newburgh court to have her charges read and enter a plea. She was escorted in by two burly men who had quite a lot of trouble restraining her. She swore, kicked, and fought, and in the process knocked over furniture. 
As the judge read the charge of grand larceny in the first degree, Lizzie continued to tear at her clothing and produced a small strip of fabric she used to begin removing imaginary dust from the railings before her. She didn't acknowledge or seem to comprehend the charges brought against her or the seriousness of the court. Based on her actions and testimony of her jailers, a psychiatric evaluation was ordered by the judge to determine if Lizzie was indeed insane or playing the part as her husband insisted that she was doing to avoid prosecution. Notice here that Halliday was even aware of Lizzie's previous stay at a mental facility. Maybe she had told him about it, or maybe he found out some other way, but he remained with her regardless. She was examined, and it was determined that more examinations were required, so for the next few months she was shuttled between jail and various asylums until she was eventually tried for the horse death, and a verdict of guilty was rendered with her sentence to be carried out at the state asylum at Middletown. She was diagnosed with homicidal mania, tocophobia, which is a pathological fear of pregnancy, a pupural mania, which we call postpartum depression today, and labeled as a destructive sociopath. The doctors were confident that her episodes were often caused by late menstrual cycles, which in turn would cause her fear, panic, and angst. The doctors made notes that she would often see reptiles or other creatures on herself or on others, including a family of snakes that were living inside her stomach. Her solution was to starve them out. Lizzie was released in the spring of 1893. And who do you think picked her up from the asylum? You're right. Her husband, Paul Halliday. Neighbors noted later that the two of them seemed inseparable from that point forward. But it was not out of the newfound love, but out of Paul's wariness of Lizzie. From what can be figured out from looking back on the crimes, it did not take long for Lizzie to begin to plot a way to get rid of her husband. At this time, many doctors still traveled around to see their patients, and even though she was being closely monitored, she managed to gain an acquaintance in one whom it is suspected she managed to either steal or was given vials of chloroform, which is used to anesthetize a patient. Then she managed somehow to get a gun from Paul without him knowing about it. Can you believe that? and planned her escape. It was early 1893, and one of her husband's other sons decided to stop by to see his father when he hadn't been seen by the neighbors in a few days. He brought along with him his wife and brother-in-law. Lizzie met him at the door and said his father was simply out of town but would be back soon. The son laughed but was flagged down by a local constable and John McCord who had concerns about what was going on at the property and had been watching the farm. With the son's agreement, on September 4th, 1893, the constable got a search warrant for the property, and after tricking Lizzie to travel with him to Bloomingburg, where she said Paul had gone, the home was searched. They found a bucket in which Lizzie had been scrubbing a rag rug with a stiff brush. The stain on the rug looked suspiciously like blood. Inside the bucket, they also found a piece of rope that seemed to be stained with blood as well. Looking around the house, they also found an axe handle which seemed bloody on the end, a crowbar, a bloody board, and two shovels. What is clear is that there would only be a need for one shovel if there was digging for one person to be done, and two shovels for two people to dig. There also seemed to be extremely large amount of dirt and hay on the floor and doors, which, when pushed aside, seemed to be covering blood-stained floorboards. The search continued for her husband, as it looked very certain that he was dead. The bed was covered in clothing, but when this was pushed aside, they found blood-stained sheets as well that had been washed recently. A hole was cut in the sheets, which was thought to be done to hide evidence. What they didn't find was Paul Sr. anywhere. Seeing the shovels, they were concerned that he had been buried outdoors somewhere and that he would never be found. After having searched the house, the party went outside to look around. One of the men ventured into a small crawl space under the barn and saw something odd buried under the hay and manure. Upon closer examination, he had seen what indeed was a human arm protruding from the waste pile. He called out to the others searching, 
and soon the area under the barn was full of the crew searching for Paul Halliday. To their surprise, they didn't find Halliday in the pile. What they did find, however, was not one but two bodies, both women who had been bound with cloth and were both dead. It was decided that the body should not be moved and the coroner was summoned, as well as more local law enforcement. District Attorney Hill of Liberty, New York, was also summoned and eventually arrived to oversee the entire murder scene. Immediately, a telegraph was dispatched to Bloomingburg for Constable Scott to return as soon as possible and arrest Lizzie. Scott had made it to Bloomingburg, where Lizzie asked a hotel keeper by the name of John J. Bennett where the land can be found which her husband had purchased. When Mr. Bennett asked her the name of the landlord who sold Paul Halliday the land, she could not answer. It was reported that during the whole trip and interaction with Bennett that Lizzie acted sane. The coroner, Joseph Roche, from Wurtsboro, arrived at the Halliday farm. Dr. Charles Piper of Wurtsboro, who was nearby, arrived shortly after, as did Dr. Beeks of Bloomingburg and Woodruff from Pine Bush. Coroner Roche formed a panel that would act as the jury during a coroner's inquest of the men present. Under direction of Coroner Roche, the deceased women were brought out and placed on elevated boards resting on sawhorses for examination. Both women were found in undergarments except for a plain gauze vest assumed to be sleepwear. The victims were bound at the ankles, wrists, and knees with fabric and their arms were crossed over their chests. Their wrists were red in color showing that perhaps they had been bound while still alive. The light gauze tops showed powder burns and spots from a firearm and bullet holes were clearly visible on both women. There were visible marks on some of the fingers showing they had been wearing rings, which were now gone. When the crowd was asked for any help identifying the women, only speculation was made as no one recognized them. It was even suggested that they were summer guests, and that's why no one could recognize them. One woman appeared in her 20s and the older in her 40s. The number of visible bullet entry wounds were observed. The younger woman had seven, all in the region of the heart, with one passing through her right wrist before entering her body. The younger woman was deemed to have been dead for approximately two days. The older of the two women was found to have eight bullet holes, all in the region of the heart, and all within a three-inch circumference of each other. She also had an old faded calico sun hat wrapped over her face and tied loosely down to stay in place. The older of the two victims was in a pronounced state of decay, and it was estimated that she had been dead for about five days. The coroner suggested that the women were all lying down flat on their backs when shot, and may have been asleep. His verdict was that the two had been clearly killed by shots directly through the heart, leading to an instantaneous death. A full autopsy was to be performed in Bloomingburg, which would later confirm the cause of death, and lead to finding bullets still in the victims. Later, a photographer was summoned to take post-mortem photos to help identify the victims. No murder weapon was located during the search, but a bullet casing was found for a thirty-two caliber pistol. Lizzie was taken into custody and searched for evidence with the help of the constable's wife, who, looking back on it, did a terrible job. She only found some loose change and some bills in her stockings, and not the thirty-two caliber pistol, the ammunition, the vial of chloroform, and the gold watch and gold rings that belonged to the victims that Lizzie tried to dispose of by throwing them into the cesspit under the outhouse when she claimed to need the bathroom around midnight. The victims were soon identified as Sarah Jane and Margaret McQuillan and both had been lured by Lizzie from their house in New York to the farm with a promise of work. An answer of why was never gotten out of Lizzie, but I would postulate that she did not like being slighted by anyone, and this family, who were friends of the family back in the early days, did not take her in as family, or for that matter even recognize her when she met them years earlier. This was highly likely out of pure spite and long-term planning on Lizzie's part, in my opinion. Soon, Paul's body was found buried under the floorboards of the home's kitchen. He had been dead for some time. Lizzie soon found herself in a jail cell in Monticello, New York, under the watch of Sheriff Beecher and the scrutiny of the district attorney, who believed she was not only completely sane, but had an unknown accomplice who helped her bury her husband. He had to prove it, and Lizzie wasn't cooperating. By sheer happenstance, a local man by the name of Philip Kenny was part of a group that had a morbid curiosity about them and wanted to see the crazed killer held in their jail. When Lizzie saw him, she became fascinated with him and began to act like a sane and rational person. 
he even managed to get her to eat after she had been refusing by simply asking her nicely. Eventually, she opened up to Kenny and told him the following account. There were two men. They fought and quarreled down there, and they drank that terrible stuff. They wanted me to take some too. They beat me and I hollered, and they told me to take those things and throw them away, meaning the dead bodies. One man beat me over the head, beat me over the head and put me out in the dark, and I hollered, and they were going to do something. Kenny tried to get her to continue, but she clammed up, saying that she would be choked if they found out. And just as quickly as she started to tell her version of the events that led up to the three murders, she stopped. Kenny had continued to try to provoke a response, but Lizzie would only say, Now wait, Nancy, wait. Kenny continued to visit, and somehow Lizzie would act and speak coherently for a while. Lizzie started to elaborate more on the account whereby the McQuillans happened to be murdered. It was a story, or version of events she may have had planned out in her head that she thought was a plausible story. Her story would eventually revolve around a band of men who would rob and kill in and around the area. These vicious men attacked peddlers in the area, robbed them, killed them, and threw their dismembered bodies into the Hudson River. Then the story morphed into a wife swapping deal gone bad. Lizzie was brought to trial and charged in the murder of the McQuillan women and her husband. She pleaded not guilty, but when asked if she understood the charges, she said no, she did not. So her defender put in a plea of insanity and asked that a commission determine her fitness to stand trial. In the meantime, she was ordered back to jail, where she promptly tried to strangle the sheriff's wife to death. It was obvious to most that she was faking the insanity, and she was a stone-cold monster. In October of 1893, Lizzie asked Sheriff Beecher for some work. Her request was confusing, as no other prisoner had asked for any work, but it seemed Lizzie had become calmer and more lucid and was getting used to her surroundings, so she was provided pre-cut dress patterns for her to sew to keep busy. Lizzie acted as if she had just woken up and found herself in a certain predicament by no fault of her own. When asked about what she remembered, she recalled the women coming to her home brought by men who drank and fought, but now did not recall her husband being there. She didn't understand, she claimed, why she was being held because they knocked her out and she hadn't murdered anyone. The district attorney continued making a case against Lizzie that was given a considerable boost by the same sister who informed on her during the horse stuff incarceration when she had given him lots of names and contact information of people who could attest to Lizzie's past deeds and behaviors. To the benefit of the district attorney, interest from the famous reporter Nellie Bly the woman who broke the world's record for traveling around the world in 72 days, and the woman who herself faked insanity to get thrown into an asylum in order to get the behind-the-scenes story of how they were being operated, was interested in completing an expose on Lizzie. This brought more details to light about Lizzie's background that the DA needed. Nellie was very thorough and had sent reporters out to gather as much information as possible so to make it nearly impossible for Lizzie to tell her a false story. Eventually, after a lot of coaxing, Lizzie told Nellie her version of events, which, still of course, had her as the victim and a bystander of the events, not the killer, even though she revealed details that only the killer would know. This was the story that she told Nellie. One morning, my husband hitched up and said he was going away. Always before this, he took me everywhere he went, so I felt bad. I asked him why I wasn't going along, and he said he was going on business and couldn't have me. I felt pretty bad, so I said no more. Then he hitched up and put four kegs of Applejack in the wagon and two Demijohns and started off. He sold it for a man who made it near our place, a moonshiner. My husband would take it in his wagon down the road and people that drove along would buy it. He took the Demijohns and a tin cup along so he could sell it by the drink, too. He came back that night and he had in the wagon with him two men and two women. I seen they had been drinking more than was good for them, and you can know how I felt. 
They brought back two demijohns with them, and both the women and the men drank. They had some lunch with them, too, some pie and bread and a bucket of fresh butter. I was so mad I wouldn't get them supper. I just sat beside the stove, so they began to eat what they had, and McQuellen swore at Mrs. McQuellen, saying, Damn you. You blank, blank, blank. You didn't put any salt in this butter. I went to bed, my husband came in and said, I gotta get out and let the McQuellen women into bed. I said I would not, so he took his shoe and hit me over the head. I hollered and he put me out. Nellie asks, Out of bed? Lizzie replies, No, out of doors, in the dark. I hollered out there and old McQuellen came and took me in. This is my dear, he said to the rest, me and me. Then all the men pulled out revolvers. I screamed again, and McQuellen dragged me into the other room, pushed me down, and taking a bottle out of his pocket, threw a lot of stuff over my face. Chloroform it was, I guess. Then I don't know no more. Lizzie went on to claim that when she awoke, McQuillan explained she was now his, and she should take these things as he handed her a cloth wrapped around her husband's pocket watch and something that felt like a gun. When asking McQuillan where her husband was, he told her how he had gone off to another property to work which is the same line she had given her stepson when he came looking for his father. Lizzie then claimed that her stepson and his brother-in-law had something to do with the crime, and that she had once overheard them say that she knew too much, and that she would have to be silenced. Nellie Bly asked Lizzie about all the evidence at the shanty. Did she notice the blood on the floors, on the bed? Did she notice the dirt and disturbed floorboards where Paul had been buried? Her reply after gulping heavily was that she noticed nothing out of place. Everything looked fine to her on that day. She didn't notice anything wrong at all. Nellie let her know in no uncertain terms that she believed Lizzie to be completely sane and that she had always been so, that she had killed those women and her husband that day and very likely other people in her life as well. Nellie then told her she was the shrewdest and most wonderful woman criminal in the world as shown by the complete lack of remorse or, or grief over the killings, which may or may not have been completely true as Lizzie had tried to kill herself five or six times while in custody. On June 19, 1894, Lizzie's trial began. It was not what is known as a bifurcated trial, meaning that there would not be a trial phase to determine her sanity. Both her sanity and her guilt were to be tied together. And if proven guilty, she was to get the death penalty, which recently had become death by electrocution. It was possible that she would become the first woman executed in the electric chair. The prosecution quickly established that it indeed was Lizzie pretending to be someone else who lured the women to the property, that the gun took some effort to fire, so the effort to group the shots all in the heart had to be intentional and purposeful. They then established the motive for murder as robbery as the women's possessions, the money and rings that were found on Lizzie when she tried to dump them in the outhouse. It only took two days for the prosecution to make its case. The defense tried to have the charges dismissed due to circumstantial evidence, but the judge dismissed their motion. A defense based on insanity was then put into full swing because her lawyer, George Carpenter, was ordered by the court to defend her, and she provided no details to assist in her defense. He brought forth as many witnesses as he could that would testify that surely Lizzie was insane and had always been so. He rested his case after only one day. On the final day of the trial, June 21st, the DA provided their expert witness, Dr. Mann, who testified that in his opinion, Lizzie was completely sane and that there were no signs or symptoms that she was exhibiting that could not have been performed convincingly by a good actor. The defense on cross-examination, however, did get him to admit that some of the things that she did simply defied reason and logic and therefore could be classified as insane. The jury received the case at 1.30 and provided their verdict within four hours, which included a food break. The verdict was read and Lizzie was found guilty of first-degree murder, which guaranteed the death penalty. She was sentenced the following day to be sent to Danamora Prison and to await death in the electric chair. But Lizzie didn't go quietly. 
As they left the courthouse, she got the drop on Sheriff Beecher and bit his left hand so savagely that her teeth hit bone. His wound was so bad that it became infected and the doctor considered amputating the arm at the elbow to prevent the spread. By early July, New York State Governor Roswell Pettibone Flower had appointed a commission to examine Lizzie Halliday's mental status and report their conclusions. The commission doctors were handpicked by the governor himself. They, of course, found her insane, suffering from some sort of dementia, which he used to move her to Matawan Asylum, sparing her life. It was very obvious looking at the case that this was done for pure political motives and not for concern for the potential sick individual. Governor Flower did not want to be known as the governor who put the first woman to death in the electric chair. While her records from Matawan are sealed, it is known that she did attempt to escape multiple times, fought with other inmates, and that she did conspire with another inmate to attack one of the nurses who they both despised, nearly killing the woman. In fact, it was reported that it took three grown men to pull little 90-pound Lizzie Halliday off that nurse. Due to her unpredictable manners, Lizzie was secluded from the other inmates because she simply could not be trusted. That, unfortunately, did not prevent Lizzie from committing her final murder. A young nurse who had over time become friends with Lizzie and tried to show her trust and compassion whenever she was around by not keeping Lizzie bound up or the door shut and locked made the mistake of trusting her too far. The nurse, Nellie Wicks, had recently been engaged to be married and would soon be leaving the asylum's employee to move closer to where her new husband would be employed. The staff told her not to tell Lizzie as this would upset her and she would not handle it well. The advice was shrugged off as an overreaction and she informed Lizzie of her departure. Lizzie warned Nellie not to do it several times, but when she announced to Lizzie it was her final day, Lizzie put her warnings into action. She stealthily stole Nellie's surgical scissors from her belt, then managed to get her locked into a storage room, whereupon she proceeded to stab the poor Nellie 200 times. Once the door was broken down, Poor Nellie only lasted another two hours before dying from the attack, becoming the first female corrections officer in the United States ever killed in the line of duty. As punishment, Lizzie received solitary confinement that lasted for the next five years. At this time, she also managed to develop a chronic kidney disease, which eventually killed her in 1918. She was buried at a grave at the asylum, but only given a headstone with an ID number and no name. Well, Trippers, I hope you've enjoyed this rather lengthy look into the life of Lizzie Halliday, and we would like to have you give us some feedback. What do you think? Was she faking it until she just wasn't anymore? Or was she always truly insane? Your thoughts and opinions will help us decide on whether or not we will do more features like this in the future. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of the Road Tripping Podcast. But if you liked it and want to hear more, please subscribe to the show feed and give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast directory. The more positive reviews we receive, the more trippers we'll be able to find us and the faster we will grow, thus able to bring you new content. Be sure to visit our website, theroadtrippingpodcast.com, to keep updated on future shows, leave show suggestions, and see all the ways to find and interact with us all in one place. If you are able and feeling generous, then a link to our Patreon page can be found under the support link on the homepage. As always, until next we meet, stay safe, trippers.